Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ian Rowe, a visiting fellow at both the American Enterprise Institute and the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. And most importantly for today's discussion, I am the CEO of Public Prep, a network of public charter elementary and middle schools located in the heart of the South Bronx and the Lower East Side of Manhattan. It is my honor to welcome you to what I believe will be a very provocative discussion on a compelling new book, How to Educate an American the conservative vision for tomorrow's schools published by Templeton Press. We are joined today by a fantastic group of panelists, beginning with Mike Petrilli and Checker Finn, respectively the president and president emeritus of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. How to Educate an American was the brainchild of Mike and Checker, and today they're going to share with us the original inspiration behind the book and why its themes are even more important now to revitalize K-12 civic education. Joining us today as respondents are David Bob, president of the Bill of Rights Institute. David has worked for 20 years to build strong civic education programs that engage the hearts and minds of young people. Previously, David worked at Hillsdale College and is author of a book on the vital role of humility in politics. Uh, welcome, David. Uh, also joining us is Jonah Goldberg. Jonah is the ASNES Chair in Applied Liberty at the American Enterprise Institute and is the Editor-in-Chief of the Dispatch. And like me, uh, Jonah actually has authored a chapter in How to Educate an American. And finally, Sarah Morgan Smith, Director of Faculty at the Ashbrook Center, which seeks to restore and strengthen the capacities of the American people for constitutional self-government. Thank you all for joining. Uh, two quick housekeeping notes. We will be doing a Q&A, so please submit questions in one of two ways. Either you can email nicole.pen, P-E-N-N, -N, at AEI.org, or submit questions to the hashtag EducatingAmericansAEI. Uh, and then second uh, note is that this webinar will, of course, be posted on both the AEI and Fordham websites. And I'm also pleased to share that C-SPAN Book TV's website will also air the discussion. Now, it's fair to say that the world has changed quite dramatically since Mike and Checker first conceived how to educate an American. As Mike, as Mike will soon share, they wanted to gather a group of scholars to provide a compendium of ideas that would reinvigorate conservative thought in education and ensure young people would value the nation's history, understand its system of government, and cherish its founding ideals. But then, uh, what I describe as two earthquakes and a tremor occurred. The first earthquake is, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. And as someone who runs a network that is in its third month of distance learning for 2,000 students, and now we're doing massive amounts of scenario planning for what school will look like in the fall, the one thing that is certain is that instructional delivery in K-12 education is going to look radically different. What has been less discussed is the more than anecdotal evidence suggesting that children who entered the pandemic embedded in strong, typically married families were much more likely to be protected from financial and emotional stress. How will that fact change the urgency of what we teach young people about the importance of building strong families and a strong civil society in a post-COVID world? The second earthquake, as I describe it, is the New York Times 1619 project. If you're not familiar with 1619, it is the New York Times attempt to place slavery at the very center of our national narrative and the year 1619 as the true founding of America and not the year 1776. The revisionist history of 1619 has widely been discredited by historians on both the left and the right and its premise is being challenged by a group of scholars and activists led by Bob Woodson, who's formed the 1776 Project. But despite this opposition, the 16, 1619 Project lead author won the Pulitzer, which will likely only accelerate the distribution of a 1619 curriculum, which is already in thousands of urban schools, ensuring that primarily low-income kids of color grow up with an understanding of American history that says the country's founding ideals were, quote, false when they were written, and that, quote, anti-Black racism runs in the very DNA of this country. 
how do we focus on civic education when that's a growing movement in urban schools? And beyond these two earthquakes is what I call the tremor, a periodic dis uh, disruption that regularly reminds us of the crisis in civic education that exists in America. New NAEP results, the nation's report card, were just released, revealing that the percentage of eighth grade students who, de who demonstrated profici proficiency in content knowledge and skills was just 24% in civics, 25% in geography, and 15% in US history. And in history, only 10% of eighth graders can explain why the South lost the Civil War. Unfortunately, these numbers are nothing new as these rumblings have been repeated for years. So with that framing of the challenges um, comes how to educate an American. And the lead editor, Mike Petrilli, is going to kick us off. Mike, tell us, given how the landscape has changed, how has the relevance of how to educate an American changed or even been enhanced? Right. Well, thank you so much, Ian. I appreciate that. Uh, first of all, for hosting uh, and moderating today, but especially for all the great work that you and your colleagues are doing for the boys and girls and young men and young women in your schools in New York City. Uh, and thank you to the American Enterprise Institute for hosting this. Uh, it was supposed to be a live event once upon a time. Uh, COVID obviously made that impossible, but we appreciate uh, forging ahead with this webinar. And we understand that there are many hundreds of you out there watching and uh, we appreciate your time as well. So when Shekhar and I launched the project that would become How to Educate an American more than two years ago, we did so from a place of frustration. That's because the national education reform movement that roared across America after a nation at risk felt like it had run out of steam. While reform efforts still inch along in some states and communities, they appear to inch backward almost as often. It's a version of the stagnation that Ross Douthat writes about in his new book, The Decadent Society. We felt stuck. There have been some non-trivial successes. Standards and expectations are higher almost everywhere than they used to be. Achievement has risen a bit, at least in the earlier grades, mostly in math and especially for the lowest performers. Some learning gaps have narrowed and many opportunities are wider. Uh, millions more families have options for their children's education as it's no longer taken for granted that students will attend their district operated public schools closest to their homes. Uh, so those are all things to celebrate. Uh, and many of these reforms driving ideas were conservative in origin although making them happen typically entailed bipartisanship and compromise, as Democrats and Republicans, mostly center left and center right, found common ground in pursuit of some big changes in a deeply entrenched education system that was not successfully serving many of their children or the society in which they live. Now, as we all know, bipartisanship is in tatters today in many realms of our national life, and that's a big problem on countless fronts, Yet, as AEI's Yuval Levin writes in his chapter in this book, it's also an opportunity for conservatives to recognize that the gains made possible through bipartisanship also meant suppressing important differences and neglecting some vital elements of schooling in particular and education in general. It seemed like time to lean into these differences, to highlight what's been neglected, lost, or distorted, and address some troubling education voids and see if we can renegotiate terms before the next wave of bipartisan reform. So that was the purpose of How to Educate an American, the conservative vision for tomorrow's schools. In it, almost two dozen right-leaning public intellectuals and scholars responded to our request to help us, quote, address the big questions about where America finds itself at this moment in history, where we're going or should go, and the role of primary secondary education in taking us there. Now, as should be expected uh, from this incredible group of creative thinkers, uh, they all set off in many directions, and yet their separate musings turned out to revolve around just a few key themes. One theme revolved around good character. That includes moral education, properly construed, but also the critical work of helping young people find purpose and feel needed. The benefits of asking students to work hard in their studies and beyond, and the injustice of dubious discipline reforms that reinforce a soft bigotry of low expectations around student behavior. The second big theme urged a broader view of what comes after elementary and secondary education. Uh, many of the authors argued that college need not be the only pathway to dignity or the middle class. And a key goal of our school should be in, to inform teenagers about 
the success sequence and encourage them to follow it. Uh, as we know, that sequence is to finish school, to get a full-time job, to get married, and to start a family in that order. Uh, as uh, Ian, I'm sure, will we'll say a little bit later, uh, Ian, in his chapter, uh, writes a lot about the success sequence and these broader issues of family structure. Finally, the third theme, and the one we're going to be discussing today, is the importance of rekindling students' understanding of American history, civics, and citizenship including the kind that instills an informed love of country, even as it acknowledges past failings and present challenges. That was the focus of Jonah's fantastic chapter about irradiating the past, about which we'll hear more in a moment. It was also the subject of Elliot Cohn's wonderful essay on patriotic history, a history that is both pro-American and also critical of the many ways our beloved nation has fallen short of its ideals. It was the theme as well uh, by a chapter by Adam Meyerson and Adam Kissel of the Philanthropy Roundtable about how donors can, pr can promote an excellent, engaging version of civics education without relying solely on public institutions. And it was a big part of the concluding chapter by former Education Secretary William J. Bennett, expressing his concern that more than three decades after Don Hirsch warned us about cultural illiteracy, we still fail to teach our youngest students history and geography, science and the arts, all important in their own right, but also essential if we are ever to win the war against illiteracy. What all these essays have in common, in my view, is a broad agreement around the problem, even if we remain somewhat flummoxed about how to respond. The problem, simply put, is that the academic left has embraced revisionist history as a means to attack America's history, and especially its founding, as inherently unjust and even racist. This version of history jumped the shark from elite colleges and universities into our high schools, especially via textbooks like Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, and more recently, as Ian noted, the 1619 Project. This, in turn, has politicized our K-12 history classrooms. Now, that's not to say that history was taught perfectly in the past. Way back when, our schools were surely too eager to gloss over the country's failures and too often did so with boring lectures to boot. But the challenge from Zinn and his counterparts cannot be ignored. Those who lead and teach in our schools have to choose how to respond. I suspect that much of our discussion today will focus on the question of the right response. Now, some conservatives may dream of eradicating Zinn and the like from our schools, of returning to an unabashedly patriotic version of history focused on great men and wars won, and perhaps that might actually happen to some extent in deep red America or in conservative private and charter schools, a version of the Benedict option. But is that really the best solution? To accept that some American kids will be taught red American history while others will learn blue American history? Is there a way to teach a red and blue, even a purple history? An understanding and appreciation of our past that in Elliot's Cohen, Elliot Cohen's formulation is both patriotic and critical? without avoiding the conflicts and controversies, which would make history even more boring and unengaging for our teenagers. That's the challenge the nation's educators face. And I hope that today we might give them some hope that it can be met. Thank you. Michael, thank you for that great introduction and framing. Now we are going to hear from David Bob, president of the Bill of Rights Institute. David, thank you for joining us and please share your thoughts. Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you, Mike, for, for that excellent framing and for uh, you and Checker putting this uh, outstanding volume of, of essays and reflections together. You know, in uh, 2015, the South Korean government set in motion a plan by which a new book was unveiled. The Correct Textbook of History was its title. Now, mind you, that was South Korea, not North Korea. Uh, it was designed uh, to remedy the perceived flaws of other textbooks. This resource uh, had really the imprimatur of the government. It was a regime sanctioned textbook. Now you might be thinking, isn't it great that we don't do that in the United States? And it's true, we do not have official textbooks issued by the United States federal government. What we do though have is a system in which the decision-making authority at the state level is lodged largely with bureaucrats who are choosing textbooks created by a handful of the largest publishers. And what we've done in essence is create a kind of cartel. 
this cartel has uh, produced textbooks that manage it at once to be ideologically barbed and boring. They don't reflect the viewpoint diversity that many teachers desire. Now, here's the good news. Teachers are more entrepreneurial than this system in many cases. Uh, take, for example, what the digital uh, company Newzella discovered. Administrators say that teachers are using textbooks about half the time, about half the days in which school is in session. This was pre-COVID, conducted pre-COVID. What teachers say is that they're using their official sanctioned textbooks about one out of five days. Now, I think that's a good thing. And as several contributors point out in How to Educate an American, we need to do more to help district, charter, private, and homeschooling teachers, parents, have ready access to viewpoint diverse resources. These resources need to challenge students on how it is that they can become thoughtful, patriotic citizens. Robbie George in particular makes a powerful case that viewpoint diversity should be a public and private good, and it must be ultimately the foundation on which we build a sound civic education. This part of the solution in particular suggests that the subtitle of the book, The Conservative Vision for Tomorrow's Schools, might well be amended to A Vision for Tomorrow's Schools for All Americans. In other words, sound civic education is neither conservative nor progressive, neither left nor right. It does not push a political agenda, but it does ennoble our polity. Civics teaches its students, young and old, the vibrancy of civil society. Now, civics is also inescapable uh, in, in it, whether or not there is a course called civics for secondary school uh, students, they're, they're constantly forming, for good or ill, a viewpoint on American ideas and institutions. For most young Americans, that worldview is inchoate. Sound civics, as Eliot Cohen forcefully argues in the essay in this book, should be patriotic. He admits, however, at the end of his essay, but does not explore as much as I would have liked, that patriotic history needs guardrails to ensure that it doesn't feed ideological narratives like the lost cause idea relating to the Civil War. Cohen advances what might be called the syllogism of this book sections on civic and history education. Let me just summarize it using his words. Here I quote, without civics, our political institutions are reduced to valueless mechanisms. Without history, there is no civic education. Without civic education, there are no citizens. Without citizens, there is no free republic. I endorse this line of argument and greatly appreciate Robbie George's reminder that civics and history, as well as philosophy and every other humane inquiry, must be grounded in humility. Our task, I believe, is not mainly to have another period of lamentation about NAEP scores, but rather to take up the task of supporting teachers. Parents and administrators need to recognize that it is a hard task to be viewpoint diverse. And I believe, having seen this for the last six years at the Bill of Rights Institute, that many of our teachers in the social studies community are very much in favor of, and indeed do every day a viewpoint diverse presentation of civics and history. There are resources that we've created at the Bill of Rights Institute that seek to be part of the solution. I just want to mention a couple of them before uh, turning my time over. The website teach.mybri.org has hundreds and in fact thousands of different resources that teachers can choose from to support their work. As the next slide indicates, these are on topics that relate to things that often are really hard subjects. For example, how do we balance liberty and security? How do we talk about in a plural way, religious liberty? How do we understand immigration? How do we uh, note and celebrate those remarkable accomplishments done in the spirit of the Declaration of Independence, like the 19th Amendment? As the next slide shows, there's a lot of things that I think can be done to directly engage students. Uh, they just got done, for example, millions of students taking advanced placement exams. We had seminars and webinars that engaged those students with those ideas and a rich conversation. And on July 6th, the Bill of Rights Institute will release a publication called Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, a history of the American experiment. It employs 100 leading academic historians 
who agree on virtually nothing to debate point counterpoint all of the key questions of history. In so doing, students are invited to a conversation, a rich conversation that spans decades and centuries of debate and dialogue. And we think that the outcome of that kind of thing is the really uh, the, the sound civics that this book rightfully points us in the direction of. Thanks so much. David, thank you very much. I think the, the points about uh, viewpoint diversity and the fact that history is neither conservative or, or, or liberal, those tremendously resonate. And Checker, uh, David recommended a, a, a different subtitle for the book. Not that there's necessarily a conservative vision, but a vision for all children. You ready to change the subtitle? As soon as the uh, Templeton Press is ready to publish the second edition <laughs> with uh, 80,000 copies this time uh, because of the demand that, it, that this show is generating, uh, yes, let's change the subtitle. Excellent. Well, Checker, uh, now's your time to share your reflections. You know, Mike gave us a bit of the, uh, the origin story, but what was your hope when you uh, decided to create this? Well, we had a number of hopes having to do with reinvigorating education reform and re-engaging uh, people on the right in the education reform conversation and, uh, and effort, uh, believing, as he and I both do, that while we are staunch supporters of school choice, sometimes um, when conservatives think about education reform, they focus only on choice and ignore all of the other things that are involved with uh, uh, quality education, with quality choices, uh, with kids who don't make choices, with kids who don't have parents who make choices for them, uh, and uh, with a whole variety of other things. So we felt that a much broader brush was needed to go at the uh, future education reform issues. And the book, you know, has 18 chapters and, and spans a bunch of topics from, from gifted education to uh, family structure, uh, to uh, student engagement and student effort and, and so on. Uh, but we did want to uh, talk primarily today about the civics and history uh, element of the book, which is much of it, as Mike said, and is a major theme around which many of the authors, authors congregate. Uh, and I, I mean, I've been a history warrior, I guess, since I was a history major uh, pr back in the late Middle Ages uh, in college. Uh, and uh, have also despaired, I will say, over the decades uh, at Fordham and elsewhere about the parlous state of social studies education in American schools. Um, and that it, social studies is typically what both history and civics are embedded in in, in American schools. And uh, it's often a kind of a mishmash, actually, in the elementary and middle grades. Uh, and then in high school, typically, consigned uh, to a single year's course in US history and a half year or, or one year course in, sometimes it's called civics, sometimes it's called American government. Uh, when I was a teacher, it was called Problems of American Democracy, uh, a course which incidentally at an eminent uh, a New England public high school had no curriculum whatsoever. Um, the teacher was told to go to the book room and find stuff that the kids should read that might illustrate some problems in American democracy, whatever they might be. Uh, that was the that was the state of the curriculum uh, back then, and uh, uh, one of the things David has just usefully done is illustrate the uh, extent uh, and variety and quality of many of the materials currently available in the modern world for uh, educators who uh, who want them and know what they're doing, uh, and are enabled within their school schools or school system to use good stuff. We are no longer textbook dependent, or at least we don't have to be. Um, and um, there is a, a wealth of material there, uh, but it's 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 um, it's frust its use is frustrated <clears throat> by some kind of endemic problems uh, in social studies education. Uh, one of which is is frankly poorly trained teachers in many cases, uh, who are assigned to teach social studies but never studied much of it themselves. I grew up in the schools where only, as today, 15% of kids are proficient uh, in history on the on the eighth grade NAEP results, uh, and a lot of um, a lot of today's teachers were, to put it bluntly, in the other 85% uh, 
uh, when they were in eighth grade. Uh, and it didn't necessarily get, get cured as they made their way through college and, and ed school. Uh, additional problem is that um, state policy, uh, while it requires social studies, usually doesn't make it a part of the state accountability system. Uh, usually there, it doesn't matter uh, for a school's rating from the state, whether the kids are learning social studies, uh, often it doesn't matter other than the teacher's grade, whether they pass a social studies course in order to graduate, Often there's nothing like an end of course assessment that would, by which the state will have a kind of external check on whether anything's actually been learned. Um, uh, oftentimes this is left to districts to work out. I'm glad there's no national social studies curriculum. I totally don't wanna be South Korea. Um, but it is the case that in this country, states are responsible for seeing the kids get educated. And in today's America, God, more than any time in my memory, that means wanting kids to grow up to be competent citizens of a United States of America. Uh, and for that to happen, uh, civics and history education have just got to be part of the fabric. Uh, they're, they are intertwined. They should be intertwined. I, they are certainly intertwined in the, in the K-8 social studies uh, uh, fr frameworks or, or standards of most states. Uh, and, um, and we're doing a dreadful job of both of them as evidenced by the NAEP results. Uh, but it's not impossible. I, I remember just a few years ago, the college board was overhauling its advanced placement uh, framework for, for US history. Uh, and in so doing, they first um, went into a kind of a bluish uh, framework for um, the US history framework. And then people called them on it and they said to their credit, let's go back and, and fix it. And uh, the AP US history framework right now is uh, by I think common consent and with almost no more critics, um, a nicely balanced, not just viewpoint diverse. Um, I'd go farther than that and say there is a kind of a, um, a, a, a solid core to it that basically everybody recognizes are important uh, concepts and skills and knowledge for kids to acquire as they study U.S. history. Now we're talking there about a non-trivial number of kids. I mean, hundreds of thousands of high school kids every year uh, take AP U.S. history. Um, I, I'm offering it right now merely as an example of the fact that it's possible to do this well. Uh, and that if our schools and districts and states uh, set out to do it well, and incidentally also made it count, which AP makes it count for those kids. Uh, I think we could be doing a vastly better job of preparing future citizens of the United States than we're doing today. Thank you very much. And I'm delighted to, uh, to turn it back to you, Ian. Checker, thank you for that. I, I, I share with your belief that there shouldn't be a national social studies curriculum that should be mandated by the government, but maybe that there should be a mandate that one does exist <laughs> and it's required state by state. Uh, Jonah, uh, you wrote a great uh, piece that used James Bond as a, uh, as a vehicle through which to talk about irradiating the past. Tell us about uh, your reflections on the topic. Sure, uh, and all the requisite thank yous and I'm honored to be here and all that, um, which had the benefit of being true. Um, yeah, so the, the, the I, I borrowed from the movie Goldfinger, the James Bond movie, just to sort of make the point that in the movie, uh, the villain's plan is not to rob Fort Knox, which is what the audience is led to believe in the beginning. Um, what he actually intends to do is detonate a small dirty bomb inside Fort Knox, irradiating all of the gold to make it useless for generations to come, thereby making his own stockpile of gold infinitely more valuable. And I use it as a metaphor for the way the sort of Howard Zinn left and others, and now the 1619 Project, which I'll talk about in a second, um, their approach to American history is to basically toxify everything that is on the good side of the ledger in American history, so that the only history that is left 
is one tale of victim, victimization and woe and bigotry, and that these things never shrink in the rearview mirror of, of history. They just, they, they become like the mark of Cain and are a permanent problem with America that has never gotten better. And my own view on all this, I mean, I, 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 I like that, that Checker brought up school choice earlier. I'm in favor of school choice as well. I have school choice. I send my daughter to a private school. Most of my friends in DC send their kids to private schools. And this problem that I'm describing is probably worse in these schools than it is in the public schools. Um, because at least somewhere in the chain, there is a politician who's worried that they might get in trouble if they teach something terrible in public schools. But the people who send their kids to these private schools, they want their kids to be taught all of the social justice shibboleths that will get them into an Ivy League school. And being able to talk about the permanent you know, stain of slavery and all these kinds of things is a, is a feature, not a bug. My own view is that much like Elliot Cohen's, I think there is such a thing as a patriotic version of history. And I think the word patriotic probably needs to go though. Um, much like the word conservative needs to go because it's just bad branding, even though I think there's nothing wrong with them. My own view borrowed in large part from Yuval Levin is that conservatism really is boil, really just boils down to um, gratitude when you strip it of its epistemological and its partisan and its philosophical um, priors, it boils down to the idea that what are the things that you find lovely and lovable um, about the society that you live in, the world that you live in, that you want to preserve and pass on to your children. This was sort of Edmund Burke's contract between you know, the, 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 the living, the dead, and the unborn. And there's a story to tell about America that does that. And you have to teach the Howard Zinn stuff. You have to teach the slavery and the Trail of Tears and all of that, in part because if you don't teach that, you cannot teach the story of, of the improvement of this country towards a more perfect union. I very much want to teach, you know, first, the first thing you have to teach is that slavery was evil, was a moral evil. You can then point out that it existed in lots of places. One of the remarkable things about the West isn't that we had it, but we got rid of it. Um, but it was, but second to it being evil, it was profoundly hypocritical for a new nation born under the proposition that we are all equal in the eyes of God and should therefore be equal in the eyes of government to have an institution like slavery. It's no, no hypocrisy for Spain to have slavery, but there's a profound hypocrisy for a country founded on the, the patriotic ideals that we have, not the nationalists, but the patriotic ideals. And, but the great thing about hypocrisy is you can only be hypocritical if you have principles. Hypocrisy illuminates the principles that this country was founded on. And it also illuminates the best version of ourselves. And so there's a wonderful story to tell, not about 1619, which as far as I can tell is just, you know, shoddy propagandistic history. Um, doesn't mean everything in it is wrong, but the contextualization of it is, by my lights, ludicrous. Um, and the idea that the American founding, I mean, the American Revolutionary War was fought to protect slavery is just bat guano crazy. But uh, um, you want to teach all the bad stuff and, and teach the story of the unfolding realization of the principles that make this country exceptional, that make this country a place we should be grateful to live in, a place where we can understand this, it, that illuminates the sacrifices and the shortcomings of the generations that came before us in a way that is honest and, and soul searching. Um, I think if you, could, if you could get that into the curriculum, a lot of the civic stuff would sort itself out. And the viewpoint diversity point, I'll just close on this. You know, I'm a, I'm a you know, my real job is in journalism, not this highfalutin stuff. And my view is, some of the best journalism in America is opinion journalism because you know where the author is coming from. And the best opinion journalism is like an argument in a court of law. We all know that the prosecution is biased against the, the defendant. And we all know that the defense is biased in favor of the defendant. But each side has rules they must follow. They have to tell the truth. They have to marshal evidence. And they have to deal with the other side's best arguments or they'll lose. And viewpoint diversity should just be seen like that to me. Different sides of a question, 
that are presented honestly, that characterize the other side's position fairly, and allow the students and the teachers to illuminate the various issues and contexts that make this a significant thing to understand in the first place. And I think this book can help in all of that. So th and thanks again for having me. Thank you, Jim, that was excellent. Sarah, uh, the Ashbrook Center has been phenomenal work. I've been watching several of the webinars that you've been producing re recently. Tell us about some of the resources that you provide at Ashbrook to address these issues around civic and your views here. Absolutely. And I'm going to carry on with the theme of talking about the importance of viewpoint diversity. Um, but I'm going to tweak it a little bit because what we do at Ashbrook is to talk about text, not textbooks. Um, so we are not interested in a patriotic history or a Howard Zinn history or, you know, however you want to characterize those things. If that history is the product of historians uh, filtering through and interpreting the past for students and teachers. What we do is we connect students and teachers and interested citizens with actual documents from the past. Um, we are, I'm one of the co-editors of our core document collections. Um, when it's all done, it'll be 45 individual volumes on different themes or um, focused on different time periods in our nation's past. Each of those volumes brings together somewhere between 25 and 40 documents that um, come from different people who actually lived through the things we want to investigate, right? So there can be letters, they could be speeches, um, but they're not just like, you know, the great men on the stage pushing history forward. They could be things from people who were down in the dirt um, and being affected by these policies and sort of thinking through them. Um, so one, one thing that I really think is important when we talk about viewpoint diversity is that it's not just viewpoint diversity in our own time, but it's actually understanding that there were multiple viewpoints at all times in America's past, and that we want to try and engage as many of those voices in the conversation as possible, and to allow them to speak on their own without applying layer upon layer of gloss. Now that's really difficult, right? I mean, I'm a 17th century scholar by training, um, so I know that words that we look at today and say, oh, that's, you know, that's the obvious meaning didn't mean that in the 17th century. And you can't just put a text in front of a seventh grader and expect them to know that. There's obviously some uh, scaffolding that has to take place to get them to see where the language has shifted over time or um, to dig into the nuance. But when you begin to do that work, um, and what we do at Ashbrook is we do teacher seminars where we bring the documents and the teachers into the room and we sit around the hollow square table um, and we do that work with them and, and model and engage them in that process so that they can go back and do it with their students. When you do that work, then you really can begin to think for yourself about the past and not to accept the interpretation of even the most eminent scholar. Um, so that's, I think that's the, the real big key for me in thinking about this viewpoint diversity essay, which Robbie George's essay was great, but I would have liked to have thought about it more historically and chronologically as well as in our current context. The other thing I'd like to say about the volume, um, and we can maybe pick this up a little bit in the Q&A, is um, so much of the focus of this conversation has been on schooling, uh, as in students in the context of a K to 12 school. But education and learning, and particularly civic learning, take place in many more environments than the four walls of a classroom. Uh, my own background before I, um, I started working with Ashbrook was actually in museum education. Um, so there are lots of great public history sites um, covering all kinds of stories that would otherwise be forgotten or um, that would lack nuance because we don't have text to engage them. Um, but we do have these artifacts and we do have places where we can go and engage with the past in a tangible way. Um, and so I think it would have been really interesting if somebody in, in among the contributors had thought about um, what role do public history organizations or, or history museums have in this process? And then even beyond that, especially as we think about school reform moving forward in a post-COVID-19 world, um, you know, how much do we actually need to send our students to school Monday through Friday? 
versus allowing them to get out there and engage with other elements of civil society and to apprentice themselves to wise mentors and to gain practical skills um, about actually cooperating with other people or, or learning to, um, to apply some of these character traits that we want them to have instilled in them um, in their, their real life. So those are my, my two thoughts on the book um, and I will leave the rest for Q&A. Sarah, thank you for that. I think it's a great distinction, this idea of texts versus textbooks. Um, so we are, so thank you for those comments. We're about to move into a discussion amongst ourselves. As I mentioned earlier, we will be doing Q&A. So please uh, submit questions either directly by email to nicole.pen, P is in Peter, E-N-N, -N, uh, at AEI.org, or submit questions to uh, hashtag educating Americans AEI. So one question I'd really like to throw out to the group is, what is the real risk here? Um, you know, it's interesting, you know, we've been living with uh, civic education scores of 15% of our kids uh, understanding civics and history for a long time. You know, what is, what's the risk if uh, we don't do what uh, Ashbrook does so well, which is not providing interpretations of history, but actual texts that show the viewpoint diversity that existed at the time. What's the danger? Is this just conservatives hyperventilating? We, you know, we've lived with this. So I'll open it to anyone. What's the real risk here? Well, the general risk is worsening as the uh, polity of the country uh, divides into uh, echo chambers and warring factions and other uh, forms of um, pluribus at the expense of the unum. And so able to tolerate 15% proficient in NAEP is one thing. If the country is sort of holding together, uh, it, the risk gets a lot worse if the country is in other ways um, coming apart uh, and so uh, even agreement on which texts to discuss would be a pretty good start here. I think um, Jonah really hit the nail on the head when he was talking about hypocrisy um, and the uh, kind of the important educative purpose of hypocrisy. Um, the risk, I think, of those, those low percentages is not that students don't know particular facts, but that they don't know what the principles are that make them say slavery was wrong and I should be pissed off about it, right? I mean, if you don't understand the moral truth that is in conflict with a regime of human ownership, then you have no real foundation for the kind of moral judgment that citizens need to make about contemporary problems either. Um, and so I, th I think that what's lost is a sense of ownership of um, a, a core set of political principles. I would second that. I think there's a there's a challenge that the hyperpolarization and uh, the the kind of uh, hyperpartisanship that we've seen presents uh, for students. You know, it can come down to something very practical. Can I maintain a friendship with my friends and still disagree with them? And when you think on it at that level, the vitality and really what's at stake here is civic friendship. The idea that we can disagree about certain things while still holding to those things that make us an unum. And I think the definition of what those texts are, you know, sometimes we overcomplicate these things. Uh, what we try to do at the Bill of Rights Institute is point people back to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. You know, it's amazing how many law students go through without reading those two documents, let alone any of the Federalists. So think of what it is for a seventh grader to confront those, and certainly to do that without the intermediation of scholarly opinion weighing down on them. The first thing you have to do is confront the text. And I think the, the, the key thing that can emerge from that then are discussions and debates that don't have um, a particular end in mind immediately, right? The outcome of this process is something that's very good to the sustaining of the Republic. But ultimately, as I think this volume made very clear, the thing that's at stake is our future, period. The historian in me wants to add two comments. First to, uh, to David, 
uh, when they confront the documents, such as the Declaration of the Constitution, they also need to understand why the people that wrote those were writing them. What was going on in the world? Uh, what was England doing that uh, made people want to uh, declare their independence from it? Um, and, uh, and I, and I, and I want to say to Sarah that in addition to grasping the moral principle that slavery is wrong, it's also good if kids understand why in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries, what were the economics as well as the uh, uh, views that led people to have slaves? Uh, it, is, it is one thing to say it is, it is wrong and was wrong. It's another thing to say, so why did it happen? Yeah, and uh, you know, Ian, I think it's important for us, though, not to pretend like there was some golden age in the past where we were doing all of this really well. Uh, you know, look, in much of American history, people weren't going through school much longer than maybe an eighth grade education. Uh, you know, it was only until very recently that we had mass higher education. And there was still a sense that, you know, the country could come together uh, and, and, you know, address great challenges. I think we have this sense today that, you know, everything is sort of splintering. Uh, you know, we're all in our own little bubbles in terms of media, the polarization, all of that. I think it's a little unfair to say that schools are going to fix that, you know, and, and obviously, uh, you know, the, the people who are, let's say, the, the baby boomers today, they were educated in a very different way, uh, you know, generations ago, and, and they're still part of the problem, right? It's not like they're behaving great uh, when it comes to civics and citizenship and, and civic friendness, friendliness. So, you know, we can't put this all on the schools, but because we are at a place now where there are so few common experiences that people have, you know, there's not a draft anymore. Uh, there's not uh, three network television stations we all watch. You know, that, that school is one of those experiences that's more common. And so trying to get schools back to this place where they see preparing citizens, and I love that term, David, uh, you know, the, the sort of the, the, you know, the civic friendship, you know, as a huge part of their mission. And a lot of us in reform, we, we just haven't been talking about it. You know, we've been obsessed with college and career, you know, we've been obsessed with helping individuals find their way uh, into the middle class and beyond, which again, for, for all very many good reasons, uh, but we have not been as focused on this, this mission of the schools and especially public schools, but all schools in preparing young people for citizenship. And, and that just getting back to that, you know, Checker and I, a colleague of ours, Robert Pendicio, had a little piece a few years ago where he just went and looked on, on the big school district websites, the biggest school districts in the country almost none of them mentioned citizenship in their mission statement. <laughs> you know, like, how, how did that happen? But that, you know, it, it's a little bit, it, it just reflects that we've gotten away from this notion and we need to get back to it. Um, and I, I just add one quick, I'm sorry, John. Okay, it's, um, I agree we can't count on the schools to fix all these things. I think it's, you got it's, it's concentric circles starting with parents, moving its way out, schools got to help, other institutions got to help. But one of the things that I'm, you know, fairly obsessed with these days is the dangers of populism and nationalism and these sorts of things. And um, one of the things that civics education does is it allows for just everyday citizens, but also political leaders who are responsible to those citizens to be just a bit more rooted, rooted in the facts, rooted in the store in in the soil of reality and when you when you live in a society like we do right now where it's really just all about competing narratives on television and the internet that are uh, designed to arouse anger more than enlighten um the that sort of stuff whether it's QAnon or you know racists on the right or by my life some racists on the left or whoever when they are um when people are not equipped with the basic facts to say oh my gosh what i'm hearing here is bs it becomes all the more easier to manipulate the people and to whip them up into an outrage state of mind there's a wonderful essay by john courtney murray i think written in the early 60s where he says that the real threat at the gates of the city facing America today isn't really the communists, but it's the idiots. 
And what he meant by that was he was using idiot in the original Greek term, which meant someone who wasn't schooled enough to be fit to behave in politics. Someone who wasn't informed enough to have an opinion that mattered. And the democratization of all of our politics, the democratization of the parties, the democratization of journalism through social media and all of these kinds of things is letting the most persuasive idiots have wildly outside pow outsized power in our society today. And that is legitimately dangerous. And it's a danger that we've, ha that we've had in the past, but the technology was not on the side of idiots the way it is today. And this, I think, makes it all the more important to teach civics and just basic facts. Yep. Well, as someone who uh, runs schools, while we obviously have a role to play, it is a very heavy burden to think that we have the sole role to play in, in enhancing civic education. You know, the institutions through which young people learned what it meant to be an American, community-based organizations, their own family, uh, faith community, all of that, we need a, a renewal. And one thing that's interesting running schools, you know, we talk about this idea of America as a self-governing free society. That assumes we have individuals who know how to self-govern. This idea of rights and responsibilities. And typically when you're, uh, we have this discussion, it seems like there's a lot of focus on entitlements and rights for young people, but not a lot about responsibilities. So what would this group want young people to understand about their responsibility to be an American? What, what, what does that look like? Yeah, and I'll jump in and, and suggest that we might look to uh, one of the things that's, that's part of the 1619 project uh, as a point of departure. So there's a curriculum that was put together for the New York Times by the Pulitzer Center. Uh, they're not related to the organization that issues the Pulitzer Prize. It's interesting when you look at the lesson plans that are part of this, because one of them is something called erasure poetry. So imagine that you take the declaration, this is the example that they use, there are several other documents, and what you do as a young person is blot out the words that reveal then those words that are left, your feelings about that document or that, that statement, okay? So your Jonah, I think- Important word, your feelings. Your feelings, right? And Jonah, this goes to your point about, you know, and kind of your puzzle of, well, why is it that, that uh, uh, private schools so often are the ones that are most prone to, to take this sort of thing? When we don't have that shared reflection on well, what's the text first? Like you were saying, Sarah, how can we offer a critique of it? I think that, that most high school students are uh, certainly ready to, to, to enter into that critique mode, but first you have to spend the bulk of it on really reflecting and understanding what's there before you do anything like an erasure uh, poem. And so I think there's a way in which that reality-based education uh, requires a confrontation and it doesn't have to be boring though. It can be really exciting. You know, you, you get into these really uh, big debates and anybody that's taught, uh, I remember when I would teach uh, 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 slavery, we spent a lot of time on just trying to find out the question, why is it wrong? And that's that moral inquiry. And young people, teenagers, middle school students, even uh, little ones, uh, I have two sons, ages uh, to eight and 10, they love to enter into these debates and I think they're capable of doing it and we rob them if we don't uh, invite them to, to come into these kind of uh, debates. I'm, I'm contemplating the prospect of 12 year olds uh, erasing, uh, editing uh, Jefferson and Madison and Lincoln. Mm. That, may be our, that may be our reality. I mean, if, if these things are so outrageous, I mean, Checker, you mentioned earlier, you know, thank heavens the federal government is not imposing a curriculum. But what is the proper role of federal or state oversight if, if school districts can just independently adopt curricula that is so antithetical to the core values of the country? Well, the states can assert as much uh, influence as they choose to in this, even in so-called local control states. Um, states decide what's in the standards and what's on the assessments and what are the graduation requirements. Um, and uh, some states have a model curricula, some of which incidentally are pretty good. Um, they are almost never obligatory curricula, that is to say districts and schools choose whether they're going to use them or not. 
but um, uh, they could be mandated. You could have a high quality statewide curriculum aligned with a high quality uh, state assessment. Uh, and then the challenge would be to prepare teachers and materials uh, to appropriately and successfully teach it. Um, I think there's lots of opportunity here at the state level. Let's leave the feds out of it for the time being. the responses on that i'm actually leery of state level curricula um i mean i many moons ago served on one iteration of new jersey's uh redrafting of its state social studies standards um and you know the things that seemed important to include um even it, it were, were, were like pet, pro I mean, they were just as prone to the kinds of like pork belly um, finagling as any other political agenda is, right? And so the, you know, there was this statewide um, pretty rigorous scope and sequence of what people were supposed to do, but that didn't mean it was good. Right. And um, and the fact that it existed actually prevented teachers who wanted to do good work uh, and wanted to, you know, really engage their students with the past in a meaningful dialogical sort of way from being able to do that because there was this frog march that had to happen through the scope and sequence. So I'm, I'm leery of standardization in general. Well, yeah. and, and that's, you know, and, and I can hear that for sure, you know, uh, Fordham, where Checker and I uh, work, we've been reviewing state standards for 20 years and, and in all subjects, but certainly in social studies, most of them are terrible for exactly that reason. They're written by committee. Uh, and then so they come out, you know, medioc mediocre at best. W one thing we haven't talked about, though, is when we might be able to short circuit some of these debates, and that's when kids are little. You know, it, it certainly, when, when we're talking about high school kids, of course, uh, all the issues around viewpoint diversity uh, matter a whole lot. And uh, but, you know, if we're talking about five, six, seven, eight-year-olds, uh, you know, I think most Americans would agree with the, hey, let's just make sure they get some of the basics and hear the stories and hear, learn about our heroes, uh, have an inclusive list of heroes that they learn about. Uh, and yet, as Bill Bennett wrote in his chapter, uh, we just simply are not doing that. You know, that, that most American elementary schools today do not teach uh, any history until at the soonest, maybe fourth or fifth grade, if by then. Uh, and it's because of this notion that, well, we're, we're going to use all the time we can for, quote, reading comprehension, right? When, what does that look like? It's, it's boring, repetitive exercises about find the main idea and, uh, you know, tell us what the, what the narrative's point is. And uh, it's terrible. Uh, and it turns out that not only is it boring, it also doesn't actually work in terms of teaching kids how to read. You know, if you want to teach a kid how to read, you do need to teach them how to sound out the language with phonics and all of that. And then you need to actually teach them stuff, history and geography and art and music and all the rest. And so, uh, you know, that, it, that is a huge potential, it seems to me, is that, you know, if we could get our elementary schools teaching history again uh, in a meaningful way, uh, again, it might be, look, quote, mostly patriotic or, or Jonah's going to give us a better word uh, than patriotic to use uh, for that. Uh, and, and there'd be broad consensus around that and they get the basics of, of the basic narrative and some of the key uh, uh, people involved in this, this story of overcoming uh, you know, many of the ills and challenges that we've had. That, that could put us in a much better place. Uh, and then once kids are older, you, know, you don't have to retrod that ground. You can get into the primary documents. You can do a lot uh, more. And by the way, when kids are little, they're not cynical teenagers who think boring, that history is boring. You know, I mean, the six of us actually like history. Most teenagers hate it and they hate it because, you know, it has not been taught in a very inspiring way. So let's teach it to them when they want to hear about stories of faraway times and places. And, and let's understand that there are materials available for little kids, too, not just AP uh, U.S. history for high school kids. Uh, there's the core knowledge sequence from the core knowledge foundation, which does a wonderful job of embedding history and other things into uh, in the language arts, actually, or, or t joining them together. It's a wonderful video for little kids uh, called uh, Liber Liberty Kids um, that uh, is as well taught a basic core civics course uh, in, 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 in cartoon video form over multiple hours as I've ever seen. 
so there's lots of stuff that can work for little kids. I'm sure David's organization also has and 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 Sarah's uh, materials and for uh, young students. And let's not forget field trips, right? So to go back to my plea to remember mm -hmm. place-based learning, most field trips happen in the elementary years, right? By the time you get to middle school and then forget it in high school, there's too much content we have to do cover. Um, so we could take our kids to the places where history happened and we can engage them with the past in a way that's very meaningful and that will resonate for uh, a long time, even if they forget the specifics of the facts. Great. I think what Adam Meyerson and Adam Kissel point out in their chapter is that public history has had that very important role 85 million Americans have visited Mount Vernon over the years. And while those numbers are declining, uh, even pre-COVID, uh, there are many ways to, to have that kind of really important uh, uh, and, and, and vital uh, engagement. When, when you ask uh, parents, do you want values taught to, to, to younger kids in schools? They'll often recoil and say, well, wait, whose values? However, if you ask them, would you like responsibility, courage, other virtues taught, they say yes. And I think without being too preachy, there are excellent curricula out there that are story-based, that engage the moral imaginations of young people, and that can build that kind of uh, uh, runway for, for, for future, uh, 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 future civic education. Well, one thing that you've all uh, highlighted is the importance of teaching history, especially at younger ages. I wonder also how important it is to start teaching the social norms by which uh, young people uh, understand what it is to be an American. You know, Mike, you mentioned the teaching of the success sequence. And again, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's pretty overwhelming data that says if you finish just a high school degree, uh, get full-time work, marriage, then children, 97% of those, those folks who followed that course of decisions in that order have ended up in the middle class or beyond. That's extraordinary. But it seems that when conservatives have talked about bourgeoisie social norms, it's taken as potentially racist or imposing middle class values. Shouldn't that be as important uh, when we're talking about civics education to talk about the social norms that have defined what it means to be an American? I, let me, I'll jump in on this real quick. Oh, go ahead, Chuck. It's your show. John, no, take it. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I, this is a source of great frustration for me. And, and Charles Murray's written a lot about this. You know, one of the main problems we have in our society is that our elites won't preach what they practice. Uh, the, the divorce rate among, you know, the top quintile, whatever, you know, dividing line you want to put on it, the one percent, the two percent, whatever. Uh, the the the, divor the family, you know, per, the, the the divorce rate flattened out and, and and basically corrected itself for the most part 20, 30 years ago for those people. And it turns out that just with the success sequence, that all of these things, delayed gratification, uh, religious attendance, family integrity, um, these are things that make people successful. And that the, and they have the kind of social, moral, financial, economic capital that allows them to be successful. But there is this thing in our culture which says that you're not allowed to tell how other people how to live, even though it's the other, it's people who are, who are poor or otherwise disadvantaged who need that guidance more than anybody else. If you're rich, you can afford your sins. You can afford your mistakes. I, I always think about, um, it's an old story now, but uh, you know, Madonna who you know, made her career with, with what I used to call slattern chic, um, talking about you know, with all this stuff. Uh, she gave an interview to some magazine where she said um, that she was named Supermom by People Magazine. And she said that she had never changed a diaper because she has a staff of over like 200 people. And she can preach all sorts of things about sort of non-traditional values and afford whatever mistakes that she makes. But somebody down the socioeconomic ladder who thinks, well, this is the way Madonna thinks the world works, that's good enough for me, can't afford the kind of mistakes that she can make. And this is across, culture, this is across the society, 
the sort of new class types want to talk about a kind of society that we don't actually live in that doesn't have consequences. There are more economic benefits to get, or at least equal, to getting married as to going to college for most people. But how often do we hear how vital it is you go to college versus how vital it is to get married? And one is a much more lasting source of happiness, and it's not college. Well, my, wife would, my wife would be happy for me to say I agree with you. We're verging into another one of the themes of the book, which is, uh, we call character education. Um, and uh, I think an important point to sort of get on the table, the virtual table here, uh, is the extent to which uh, character education in schools is modeling behavior by adults in schools. Uh, and the way kids learn to behave and conduct themselves with respect to other kids and adults and people outside is by watching adults um, do it correctly. Uh, and so actually one of the prices we're paying for uh, the virtual environment right now and is that um, young kids aren't in school seeing these models. Uh, they are at home seeing whatever models they have in, in the home, which may be fine. Um, but uh, they're not seeing the other models that they might be seeing if they were in school. Yeah. Well, I'm, thank you all. I'm, I'm excited now to move to questions from our audience for which we have many, which is very exciting. Uh, Todd Cruz, a social studies teacher at Berry Hill High School, uh, who's a veteran and high school social studies teacher says that he's looking for ways to include character virtue development in his curriculum. What character traits, virtues, civic virtues, or values are key American values and virtues? What are those key five or 10, whatever number, values that need to be taught to high school students? Well, you could start with Ben Franklin's list in his autobiography. Give us a little, give us a little, Sarah. Oh, um... So you have to be humble, you have to be industrious. Um, somebody help me out, Franklin is not my favorite founder. Um, but Franklin has these very, uh, I mean, because of when Franklin is writing the autobiography and because of who he's writing it for, which is his son, um, and, um, and he's writing it after America already has won the war. And, and so now he's sort of thinking about how do we bring along a generation of genuine Republican citizens. Um, that list, as he's remembering, you know, what he tried to train himself to do as a young person is, is really modeled at that um, exact question. What does it take? To, to be a virtuous Republican. There was also yeah. a pretty good, pretty good list in the old Boy Scout Oath, as I remember it from my uh, adolescence, which as I recall, started out trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. That's not a bad list. Done. Very impressive. Very impressive. Well, you know, as you know, Amy Wax, a professor at uh, law school a few years ago, had the audacity to lay out a few social norms, and she was heavily attacked for even uttering uh, what, what, what is it about? What is it about the ease at which, Checker, you can recite the Boy Scout Oath or Sarah talking about Ben Franklin? What is it that seems so obvious uh, in the past now is a source of such conflict? I think the, the, you know, there's a thing that we've lost to suggest that virtue really does have something very much to do with, with public things. And that's in part what Franklin was getting at, because that project that Sarah described was actually hatched when he was in his 20s. And he realized that he was the kind of guy that, that, that always wanted to win the argument. And so he pulled together this list of a dozen virtues and asked a friend of his, what are, if you look at this, would you, would you, you know, suggest I work on anything else. Because what he wanted to do was embark on a project from what he called moral perfection. And the friend, a Quaker, said, well, you're kind of uh, arrogant. Why don't you try humility? And uh, Franklin, to his credit, uh, took him up on that. And then he tried to go through and put that into action. And what he did is work on a virtue each week until he got it right. And he realized that humility was really the hardest one of that, uh, that list. And I think there's an element here that's really important, and teachers know this, that there's, there's, a, there's a skills building quality to the norms that we're talking about. 
And oftentimes we've tried to put those into something called action civics. And I don't think it's a very good fit because ultimately what you're doing is before you have that content, you're running kids out into projects that very often have a very um, kind of almost activist tenor. Right. However, I do think that conservatives need to become more open to the idea that skills building in schools and beyond schools is vital. And that it doesn't have to be that action civics equals activist civics, but that we need to think mainly about content, those norms and, 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 and uh, content uh, principles really ultimately that we're, that we're I am parting to young people, but that they're doing things to put these into action is a good thing and well-constructed can be part of our formal curriculum. All right. I was just going to add one quick point um, about virtue, uh, virtue not just of, for individual character, but the character of the American people. Um, I'm actually someone who believes in American exceptionalism as originally understood, which is that, which is not, you know, waving a foam finger saying we're number one. It's that we were just different because we didn't have a feudal past. We didn't have all sorts of, there were all sorts of different things about America. Some were really good, some were really bad. We were more violent than other countries. Um, but one of the really good things was we were also more self-sufficient. There's a bit in uh, Alexis de Tocqueville where he says that in Europe, if a cart is overturned on a bridge, everyone stands around waiting for the constable to come and take control of the situation. But the Americans, they just all get together, they pick up the cart, they move it out of the road. And I think that teaching a little bit of that is really important in part because at least among elite kids who are, one, who are gonna grow up to be the opinion makers and influencers. The, the, the meritocracy, I mean, I'm not gonna get into all of Jonathan Haidt stuff, but the meritocracy is creating, a lot of kids are good at taking tests. And a lot of kids are good at jumping through the hoops that they're supposed to do to get, to, the end, to get their piece of cheese at the end of the maze, but they're fragile. And they're, you know, they, they get out of the education system and they, they are looking for someone to ask permission to, to do the next thing. And I think that's a, that's a long-term problem for the American character, the American people, is that if you've grown up your whole life where you've always had a third party authority figure to adjudicate any interpersonal conflict, and you just know how to follow instructions really well, something really important about America will be lost. Well, and Jonah, I think also, um, kids are, are deterred from thinking that there are absolute truths, right? So, um, you know, Franklin uh, adds humility, but in the book, he says to be humble like Socrates and Jesus, right? So neither of those are wishy-washy men. You know, they, they weren't like, oh, my truth is for me and your truth is for you. And like, for, no, he's, you know, Socrates is the gadfly of Athens, right? He has a true understanding of philosophy um, and he's annoying people with it. So I think it's not humility in this sense of, oh, everybody's truth is equally valid. Um, but it's also being able to, to come to some understanding of truth and make a commitment to it and to engage in a civic dialogue while still standing your own ground and saying, no, there, there's a right and a wrong here. Absolutely. Uh, we have another question from Timothy Simpson, a professor, of, a professor at the College of Education from Moorhead State, Moorhead State University. What role do teacher education programs play in creating civic illiteracy? And how can teacher education, especially social studies teacher education, be reformed to contribute to civic literacy? David, you may have some, uh, and, and, and Sarah, I would think you have thoughts here. It's a big question and it's a good one. I think one of the main things that happens, and while there's been some uh, modest steps uh, taken in the, the last uh, decade to, to try to begin to address this. One of the biggest problems is that when in, in training our, our, our teachers to be, there is so much emphasis in the teachers' colleges on the pedagogy that content mastery is left behind all too often. I believe that's the major thing that needs to be corrected. And it, by the way, gives the teachers the greatest confidence when they're entering the classroom. Uh, we are seeing in the social studies arena even greater teacher attrition 
than in some of the other fields where attrition is already sky high. And it's a pretty intimidating thing for one, if you haven't done it, um, to try to get up in front of a bunch of people, and even if they're young, and uh, talk about things if you don't know anything. So we talk a lot about critical thinking. You need to have something about which you are going to think critically. Yes. And I think that's the major reform that we could see in, in our teacher colleges. You know, the seminal truth about uh, teaching is you can't teach something that, unless you know it. So if you haven't learned it, you probably can't teach it. Well, and the challenge, of course, is that what so many people are learning in college today when it comes to history is exactly what we've been discussing. It's, it's this revisionist history uh, that may not be so much based in truth, but is uh, wedded to social justice ideals and all the rest. Look, I, I am not optimistic about putting uh, many eggs in the reform ed school basket. Uh, people have been trying for 100 years and failing. Uh, and look, frankly, you know, when you're talking about social studies teachers, uh, you know, in most states, they are not spending as much time in ed school as elementary school teachers are. You know, most states do recognize that you just don't need that many methods, classes and the like. And so you really need a history degree. You know, I, I would come back to this notion around curriculum again. You know, here, here's one way to try to push this in a more positive direction. What is it that we want students to actually be able to do? You know, let's think about the student work. What kind of essay prompts, for example, do we think, uh, you know, a well-educated American 12th grader should be able to answer? Uh, you can look at this in the AP US history. Now that's set at a pretty high standard, but even a few notches below that, what are the, you know, what kind of writing do we want uh, students to be able to do? What kind of oral presentations? What kinds of basic uh, knowledge and other skills uh, do we want them to have? If you focus on that, then you can step back and say, okay, how do we prepare teachers who can get that kind of work out of kids, who can help kids get to that point where they can complete those kinds of assignments effectively? Uh, you know, I, as a parent right now going through this remote uh, teaching uh, experience, the homeschooling, all of a sudden uh, emergency, you know, what, what we're seeing is that what school has become, it's kind of been completely stripped out of most instruction. There's very little teacher instruction that my kids are seeing anymore. It's basically now just the assignments. You know, at the beginning of the week, here are the assignments that kids need to work their way through. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, so it feels stripped down. And at the end of the day, that is what education is. It's, it's the work we expect students to do. And, uh, and so I think if we stay focused on that, uh, you know, then we might be able to get to a more constructive place. But I think that does start to get into some of those curricular issues rather than expecting as, as Checker was expected, you know, so many years ago in Newton, Massachusetts, to just sort of be able to wing it as a 22 year old and, and do the best you can. Uh, that is not a strategy that's going to get us very far, uh, in my opinion. Uh, we have a question from Serena Penn, who's a Spanish interpreter in Prince William County Public Schools. And Serena is asking, how do we educate children whose parents do not care or do not encourage education? Um, you know, as an educator, I, I think I might say, I don't think it's necessarily that parents don't care. It's just that they may just assume that the school has got this covered. But with the pandemic, a lot of parents have gotten a lot more insight into what their kids are actually doing. And I think they're not as happy. So what would folks say? How, how do we educate kids whose parents may not be as engaged for a whole host of reasons? Keep in mind that most parents do care. They may not be skillful navigators of an education system, and they may not be good home instructors uh, because they lack personal familiarity with what it is that kids are supposed to learn. And of course, many parents are simply distracted by other kids and jobs and uh, uh, duties and obligations, uh, and they just don't have much time for it. We do, incidentally, one chapter in the book about uh, what, is, what is the meaning of school choice for kids who basically don't have parents, um, kids in foster care and things like that. Um, and the recommendation there is we actually need schools for some kids to be much more all enveloping um, and actually take a much more um, active, encompassing, and some would say paternalistic uh, role in the lives of those children. Um, but I also believe, and I think a lot of charter schools have shown this, a lot of other schools as they've done an outreach the, in recent weeks, it's possible to help parents learn to become more engaged once they realize that that's expected of them and that the school isn't gonna just sort of do it for them. The school is not a, a repair shop. 
I think parents, I've, I don't know what's happening in your schools, Ian, with respect to getting parents up to speed on how to help their children. Uh, I'll bet you're doing a lot of it. Extraordinary amount. And, you know, our parents actually very much appreciate uh, the role that we're playing as school to provide resources to parents. Because again, they have much more visibility into the work and the fact that they're now playing the role of teacher. So I think there's a great opportunity here. You know, Serena, I would assume that more parents would love to be more engaged and that it's not that they don't care, it's just that they may not have the tools for being more actively engaged in their kids' education. I'd like to uh, say thank you to Serena for the work that you're doing and, and just echo what you, what you just said, Ian. I, I believe that there's a role um, for parents where oftentimes, you know, whether it's in this time when it's hard to figure out, you know, exactly what your kids are studying, you know, when there's a portal, how do you get on it? Time concerns, all of these things, right? But even pre-COVID, uh, maybe an exercise in which the, the, the child is asking their parents a question or grandparents or guardians, uh, what do you think of what we're going through now? Um, get those proverbial dinner table conversations going, even if they're not over the dinner table. Uh, we work with thousands of, of educators who are working with uh, students uh, in the ESOL, uh, ELL communities and have a resource called Being an American. And it's designed to boil down those ideas for uh, little learners um, and their parents, in fact, what are those basic things that, that, that each American sh would, 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 uh, should know? And, I think what we need is more of a dialogue going forward. And I hope that a, a thing that can come out of COVID that would be unexpected and good is for more of that interchange where parents are supporting, even if it's in modest steps, the hard work that's happening in the classrooms and vice versa. The teachers are recognizing that it's not easy for a lot of parents to be totally involved in their, um, in their kids' uh, academic lives. Just one more thing, a little curating and editing of what your kids are watching when they're not in school uh, could also go a long way, depending on the age of the kids. Um, have them watch Liberty's Kids. Have them watch the Crash Course series on history. Have them watch some Ken Burns. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful things that will educate them uh, extremely well, as long as they, someone's choosing those things for them. Uh, rather than some of the less appealing things that are, well, I should say very appealing, but less valuable things that are available to them. Good reminder of parental responsibility checker. Also, can I give um, a shout out to Schoolhouse Rock? Schoolhouse Rock was awesome. Great. And yes, Jack Black. I, uh, uh, my daughter is really, at, when she was much younger, she was, she has this nostalgia thing, which would make sense because she's my daughter. And she likes to hear about the stuff I watched when I was a kid and all that kind of stuff. And I told her about Schoolhouse Rock and my whole family, we ended up rewatching all of them. And some of them are just, it's amazing that, that how patriotic some of them are and how sort of funny and well done they are. They're a great little gateway drug for little kids. Anyway, that's my push for them. Not the analogy I necessarily want to use. But <laughs> fair, <yeah>. fair. <laughs> Uh, Adam Kissel, who's actually one of the uh, authors uh, in the book, the Director of Civic and Higher Education at the Philanthropy Roundtable, would like to hear more uh, comments about educating American adults. So enough with these K-12 to kids. What about college, non-college, post-college? How do we get more Americans to be more civically uh, or literate? You know, uh, Elliot Cohn in his chapter makes a great point that many American adults clearly do love history because it is one of the most popular uh, forms of books that people still buy. Uh, you know, that, that we've got these celebrity authors, many of whom are not academic historians, who continue to sell millions of books, and, and people love that. Checker mentions Ken Burns. I mean, there's clearly a demand out there for history. Uh, I would also say, you know, <laughs> Talk about some of the technology or things that are out there on the on the internet. Ancestry.com, uh, you know, is in a pretty cool way uh, into history. I think for a lot of families today, that you know, to be able to do this research, looking at primary documents going back in many generations, uh, to be able to tell the story of your own family, something you can do with kids uh, and you can do as adults, and again, is is a way to really. Uh, rekindle that love for history. So there's some ideas on history. I'll, I'll leave it to maybe some others to talk more about the civics and citizenship. And, and, and thank think, you, Adam, for your saying and, hello for your great chapter. And the Philanthropy Roundtable should come up with a list. 
Well, I think this is an opportunity where if we imagine like not just tinkering at the margins of schooling, but really rethinking what school looks like and how much of our tax dollars go to, you know, public schools. Um, you know, maybe if people had more control over expendable income, they would spend more of it at local history sites, right? Um, or maybe we could redirect uh, some of the tax dollars from schools to local history sites. Uh, or, you know, there are ways that we could encourage engagement in the community uh, with history, not just, you know, in the, the atmosphere of things that are published or, or packaged um, and developed by scholars, but actually getting people out into the places that are in their own backyard. Got it. I think civics has been defined too often by boring uh, charts. And there's, there's a reason why a lot of adults are, are not as engaged on the civic side, I think, than, than, uh, they might be with David McCullough and other uh, uh, manifestations of kind of popular history. Learning journeys that families can go on uh, together are something that I think we need to do a better job of. You know, very practical questions. It's a strange thing to see how much of constitutional education has become the realm of experts. And you see that even in the way that our political actors um, uh, look at it. You know, it used to be that, that you'd find more interchange between, say, politician and constituents on things. But now it's, well, we'll let the lawyers take care of that. Those questions about, about the law and the Constitution. And so I think just bringing it to a level that is very conversational about current events and, and ways that get beyond the kind of political horse race to what are the ideas that are at stake. There are organizations that are doing it out there. And I, I think... Uh, um, I've seen certainly seen deep engagement by uh, by families and 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 by by adults. Well, amazingly, we're coming to the end of our time, and so I want a just thank all of these incredible panelists. But I want to give each of you thirty seconds to a minute to answer the question: What's the call to action? If you purchase How to Educate an American, if you've just watched this webinar and you're inspired, what is it that you'd like someone to do right now to revitalize civic education in our country? What is it you're asking them to do? You know, Ian, first and foremost, to act locally. You know, if you are a parent or just a citizen, uh, show up at your local school board meetings and ask them, you know, what, what texts are you using for your history curriculum? What does that look like? And are we doing a good job uh, teaching history in a balanced way? If you're an educator, same questions. And also, you know, in terms of the values, the civic values, does our own school live up to those values? You know, are we walking the talk? Uh, because of course, what, what kids and teenagers especially are going to follow is our example, not, not our lectures. Run for, run for local school board. Uh, take seriously the election for local school board actually um, look into the views of candidates for election to the local school board. Um, educate your own children in some of the ways we've been talking about on this show, on this, on, uh, at this session, and, um, and then um, take them to Colonial Williamsburg once we're allowed outdoors and Mount Rushmore and Gettysburg and those places. Okay. Jonah? All right. I was going to uh, basically do the uh, think locally aspect of this as well, but uh, Mike just took it. So, uh, but I do believe that, you know, you do the fight for liberty, the fight for all good things begins in your own backyard. And I think that's something that uh, too many people want to outsource to national movements and experts rather than just doing the basics, of, you know, uh, that it's close to home. But since that's already covered, go on a road trip when this thing's over. Go on a historical road trip and don't let your kids have devices for the drive and go to a couple interesting historical places and talk about them and don't let them look at their devices on the drive back as you're talking about them. Right. And that would do a lot. And David and Sarah, thank you. We have one more minute left. I would just say read more. Um, you know, so find something in our nation's history that is of interest to you and read about it and then try and find primary sources that go along with it and get your kids to read them with you and talk about them or talk about them with your neighbors. But don't don't get into that echo chamber of your own head. And David and seek out views that are different from your own uh, in, in the uh, 
separate vein, I've often wondered what would it be for uh, uh, those who are coming to this country uh, through the naturalization process to be adopted, so to speak, by those who are in their community. And it's actions like that, I think, and uh, the kind of local uh, thinking that really are going to be able to turn this around. And thank you all. And if I were to answer that question, I'd say I'd want to ensure our kids do understand the rights and responsibilities of what it means to be an American and lucky enough to live in a country that affords them the opportunity to be agents of their own destiny. Thank you, everyone. This has been fantastic. We, uh, uh, we've come to the end. Please consider purchasing uh, How to Educate an American. And uh, we look forward to the follow-up and doing great things for kids.